Good evening and welcome to the services tonight. Uh, glad that you are with us. Uh, this is going to be the last time that we're going to have to record the Sunday night service or the Wednesday night service or any of that in advance. Uh, starting on the 21st, we are going back to normal, whatever that might mean. Uh, what we're going to be doing is going back to the Sunday school hour uh, at the normal time, going back to one Sunday morning service, really looking forward to that, uh, Sunday night service, just like normal, and then the Wednesday night service, uh, just like we're doing right now. And some of you, if you've forgotten that we've gotten started back, uh, please don't forget that. Be back in the services on Wednesday night. Starting the 21st, though, we are going to be starting back uh, having our Word of Life and our Olympians. We're not going to be running the van ministry or any of that, uh, so just kind of keep that in mind, if you will. Uh, so tonight, uh, we are continuing in our series of messages looking at a church and Christians in crisis. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, first of all, tonight, and then we'll get right into the message. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for another opportunity to open up the bread of life and to allow you to feed us this evening. And Lord, may we take your word, take these truths, apply them to our hearts and to our lives, and we'll thank you for it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Turn your Bible to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, as you're turning there, uh, for several weeks we studied 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and we introduced the spiritual gifts. We finished that up last week. Uh, the spiritual gifts that are found in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 have caused so many problems uh, for the church at Corinth, and not only for the church at Corinth, but also for churches today. And it all depends on your theological persuasion as to the problems that it has caused. Uh, some churches today believe that all of those spiritual gifts that are in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 are still in operation. Uh, we would believe that those gifts were temporary gifts, that they were given to the apostles, that they had a specific purpose and a time, and that's something that we'll deal with in the future, probably in a few weeks. But we also look at those gifts, and we recognize that those gifts have, have ceased, they have ended. And so they are not necessary, and they are not in operation today. And certainly, as we saw last week, the way that they tend to be practiced today they are not even being practiced the way that they were intended back when they were introduced in Scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, we know what 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is known as. We call it the love chapter. You'll hear it a lot of times at weddings uh, being presented. And maybe this seems rather disconnected from what we saw in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Uh, we're going to deal with the fact that it is not disconnected, but very much is connected. To do this, let me introduce the message this way tonight. Do you know what happens in 193 days? I'll give you just a chance to kind of think that through. In 193 days, something momentous is going to happen. If it helps, it happens at the same time every year. 193 days pushes us all the way to Christmas. 193 days, and it will be Christmas. Imagine, if you will a Christmas scene at your home or a typical home. There are going to be several family members present, a broad range of ages. Uh, there is going to be a table that's going to be set on that table. It's going to be all of your Christmas uh, favorite foods that are going to be there. And you can see the steam rising off of those foods. Uh, let the smells kind of trigger back some memories, if you would, as you imagine this. In the, over in another room, maybe you see the Christmas tree. The Christmas tree is lit. Beautiful lights all over that Christmas tree. Uh, not only that, but uh, it's loaded with presents underneath. And once the meal has finished, you're going to go into that room and you're going to start opening up those presents. And it won't be long before you are in a sea of boxes and bows and ribbons and, and uh, Christmas paper that's been torn off of all those packages. As you look at that scene, I want you to think, what is the most important thing that is going on in that scene. Now, obviously, we know that the most important thing about Christmas is Christ, and, and that is 100% true, always true. Christ is what Christmas is all about. But I'm looking at this strictly from an earthly perspective right there in that room. What is the most important thing that you see? Is it the food? Is it the Christmas tree? Is it the decorations? Is it the lights? Is it the presents? And you say, well, no, it's none of those things. Maybe you say, then, you say, well, it's the people. 
And I know what we mean when we say that it's the people. But truthfully, it's not even the people that is the most important thing. If uh, you wanted to have people gathered, you know, if you was in a city kind of a thing, you could just go outside and shout for the neighborhood to come and everybody would come running if they knew that they were going to get food and presents. So you could always fill the house up with people. There's something that is far greater of importance that is located in that scene that we cannot miss. And it's the fact that there's love present. There's love present. Uh, If there was no fancy feast, if there was no beautifully decorated tree, if there were no presents under that tree, but if there was love there, then you have everything that makes the event special and important. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, that's exactly what 1 Corinthians 13 is about. The Bible says here in chapter 13 and verse 1, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I can remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. G. Campbell Morgan many years ago wrote in his commentary, he said that examining this chapter is like dissecting a flower to understand it. If you tear it apart too much, you lose the beauty. Alan Redpath said this, he said one could get a spiritual suntan from the warmth of this chapter. As we look at this chapter tonight, let's start out first of all with the consequences when love is missing. What are the consequences that come if love is missing? What are the consequences that would come to your Christmas gathering if love is missing? As we look at this Bible, a Bible commentator wrote, it is easier to be orthodox than to be loving. It is easier to be active in church work than to be loving. Folks, to be loving takes work. It is a good work. It's a work that we should be involved in, but because it takes work, oftentimes we forget about the the love that should be involved in the work, and we just function. But if all we do is function, we have missed what is the most important thing, and we have set consequences into motion. Notice the consequences. In verse 1, there is no revelation. There is no revelation. He says, though I speak with the tongues of men and angels and have not charity... I am become as sounding brass or as a tinkling cymbal. Put a marker here. Go with me, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 8. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, look with me at verse 1. Here it says, Now as touching things offered unto idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. Let's move to the book of Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. In Galatians chapter 5, look with me if you would at verse 6. Galatians 5 and verse 6, the Bible says here, For in Jesus Christ neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. By love. You know, I'm just making noise if I don't love. That's all I'm doing. Sunday school teacher, as you listen to this, if you do not love your students... You're just making noise. I want us to consider, first of all, if I don't love you, then the preaching is just going to be noise, and that's all it's going to be. But you know, if you don't love me, then all you're going to hear is noise. And if we don't love Jesus like we ought to, it wouldn't matter who was standing in the pulpit. It wouldn't matter who was standing in your Sunday school classroom. If you don't love Jesus... It's just going to be a bunch of noise to you. You see, it's really about the love. If we want that that revelation from God as the teaching, it goes forth. And what it's talking about here in chapter 13 piggybacks on to the gifts that we saw in chapter 12. The revelation that was needed there was revelation that was telling them things that they did not know as of yet because it had not been written in the inspired canon of Scripture. So he says, "If, if we don't have love, If we speak with the tongues of men and angels, then we're just sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. We're just making noise. Where there is no love, there is is going to be no revelation of God. The second thing is there's going to be no results. Verse 2, he says, though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, 
I am nothing. You know, if a person could move a mountain, and I mean really move a mountain, just imagine the headlines, what the headlines would read. Can you imagine a headline, something like this? Rocky Mountains move into the Colorado River as Christians pray. Minister says it was a display of faith. Would you not consider that a fantastic result of the praying and the exercise of faith that took place if the Rocky Mountains just all of a sudden dropped in to the Colorado River? And yet, Paul tells the church of Corinth that even if that could happen and you don't have love, you're nothing. He says there's no results. No results because the greatest results come from a work and a ministry that is done out of a heart of love. That's where the results come from. But not only that, there's no reward. Verse 3, again, though I bestow all my goods and feed the poor, and though I, have, I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Go back, if you would, to chapter 3 of 1 Corinthians. Look at verses 13 through 15. Chapter 3, verses 13 through 15. The Bible tells us that every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Our motive should not be for doing the work of the Lord that we are doing it for reward. While it is 100% true that receiving a reward is an eternal benefit if things are done for the Lord the way that they should have been done, do we not realize, Christian, that it is possible to do all the right things? We could be the most orthodox Christian that there is at First Baptist Church, Bryan, Ohio, doing everything just absolutely right, having all of our doctrinal ducks in a row. And being willing to stand for the truth, we could do every bit of it right and have not love. The Bible says then it profits us nothing. There's no reward to that. So we come up empty-handed. So those are the consequences. No revelation, no results, no reward. The consequences when love is missing. But let's consider something. In 1 Corinthians, go back to chapter 13. And let's look at the verses that we are the most familiar with here. It says in verse 4, charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not, charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up. Doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil. Rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. Beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. The second point of the message tonight is the compensation when love is present. The compensation when love is present. Before I explain what I mean there, I want us to consider that in the King James, the Bible uses the word charity, and it's the Greek word agape that is oftentimes translated and accurately translated as love. Go back with me, if you would, to the book of Romans chapter 5. In Romans chapter 5, uh, we have a verse of Scripture here that is familiar to us. In Romans 5, this, this agape love is the love that God has for lost sinners. It says in verse 8, But God commendeth His love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's the kind of love that comes from God. You back up to verse 5, and the Bible says, And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. So not only does God love the lost sinner, but when the lost sinner trusts the Lord Jesus Christ, the act of God's love toward humanity, when the lost sinner trusts the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior, the Bible says that the Holy Ghost is shed abroad in our hearts, that the love of God, God Himself, because according to 1 John chapter 4, verses 8 and 16, the Bible says God is love. So God comes in and He indwells us. Perfect love takes up residence within us so that when we are told to love others, it isn't something that that we work up, that we generate out of our own strength and our own might and by the grit of our teeth. It has nothing to do with that. It has to do with us displaying the love that has already been put within us. That's the kind of love that we're talking about here. So going back to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, 
The Bible uses the word charity. I know a number of other translations, the modern translations, will substitute in the word love. Okay? Is that a legitimate substitution? Yes. Do I think that that is a good substitution? No. And my reasoning for that is this. It is because the English word charity does a better job of conveying what is being taught here in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. What we are about to look at, and I know that as you look at this, when it says charity suffereth long, the verses we read, there are 15 things that are mentioned there. The reason that charity is needed for those 15 things is because it highlights 15 deficiencies that we have in our human nature. Our fallen human nature has these 15 deficiencies, and it is necessary that charity is used to cover these deficiencies. When I say that it's a better idea than the word love, it's because when we use the English word love, it means all sorts of things. And I, I've said it before, but you know, we throw that word around so lightly. We say, I love God, I love my spouse, I love my children, I love my dog, I love going to certain places for vacation, I love pizza, I love ice cream, I love a warm sunny day. Do the word, does the word love mean the same thing for each and every one of those? And I would hope that we would say, well, of course not. So when you just throw out the word love, it's not going to convey in the English what we need. But the translators utilize the word charity. Think about what comes to your mind, the, the feelings, the emotions that are conjured up inside when you hear the word charity. Uh, when the word charity is used, people with pride will say, I don't want charity. I don't want it. Even though it is needed, I don't want it. Charity is something that isn't deserved. Charity is something that isn't earned. Charity is something that cannot be repaid. So it is given without hope or expectation of being reimbursed. That's charity. Charity is a handout. And that's one of the things that people say. They don't want that handout. But that's what charity is. That is what agape love is. It is God's handout. God's handout came to us as lost sinners. God's handout came to us at salvation. This, uh, this handout is to come from our hand to others, from our lives to others, to cover these deficiencies. So again, look here at 1 Corinthians 13, where it says, charity suffereth long. Read along in the scripture with me, if you would, as I show you what the deficiency is. Charity suffereth long because sometimes we're insufferable. We're insufferable. Do you know another Christian who is insufferable? Could it be the Christian looking back at you in the mirror that is insufferable? Or we need this charity because sometimes we are unkind. Or we are better off than others and we know it. Which leads us to being braggarts. And then proud in heart. And then sometimes we misbehave. And we're self-absorbed, quick-tempered, you know. Charity is, is not easily provoked, but yet we're quick-tempered. And then sometimes we are su suspicious of others, and we rehearse, we remember and we rehearse past hurts. Maybe we feed on tragedy and bad news. We feed on lies. Sometimes then we are unbearable. We are unbelievable. We are hopeless and we give up very easily. Do you hear any deficiencies that ring a bell of truth in your life that would come from this that charity needs to be used for? And here's something that charity does in regards to this. Go to 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4. In 1 Peter chapter 4, look with me if you would at verse 8. 1 Peter chapter 4 verse 8. The Bible says, and above all things, have fervent charity, fervent agape love among yourselves, for charity shall cover the multitude of sins. Charity shall cover the multitude of our deficiencies that are mentioned here in 1 Corinthians 13. That's what charity does. What does it mean when it says that charity covereth a multitude of sins? The problem is that oftentimes what we do right here is we interpret that, that charity covers it up. 
Charity covers it up. There is nothing in the scripture that tells us to cover up sin, to pretend that it didn't happen, to sweep it under the rug. That's what a cover-up is, to lie about it. There's nothing in scripture that tells us to do that. So when the Bible says that charity covereth a multitude of sins, what's being taught there? Let me give you some things uh, that I discovered as I was studying. First of all, love covers by forgiving. And a couple of Sunday mornings ago, maybe three Sunday mornings ago, we dealt with this in the model prayer. And I'm not going to go back through and rehearse what this means. But when there is love, love will forgive. That is covering sin. The next thing that it does, love covers up, or excuse me, covers by refusing to keep a record. By refusing to keep a record, not only refusing to keep it, but refusing to review it. When charity covereth a multitude of sins, that's what it's talking about. Turn, if you would, to the book of Proverbs chapter 12. Here's something else that love covers, charity covers. In Proverbs chapter 12 and verse 16. Proverbs 12, look with me at verse 16. The Bible says, a fool's wrath is presently known, but a prudent man covereth shame. Go over to chapter 17, look at verse 9. Chapter 17 and verse 9. He that covereth a transgression seeketh love, but he that repeateth the matter separateth very friends. Love covers by refusing to tell all, by refusing to gossip. We are living in a day where where a person can write a book and it's their tell-all book. The insiders in government are going to tell all. The insiders in Hollywood are going to tell all. And there's always plenty of people that want to hear the scoop. They want to know the dirt. They want to know what really happened. Folks, that is not love. That is not godly charity. Godly charity not only refuses to review, to rehearse, to remember the record, but it refuses to tell all. It refuses to gossip. Love covers by protecting the offender and the offended. It covers uh, by protecting the offender and the offended. Real biblical charity wants to help both parties. Definitely doesn't mean sweeping it under the rug, but helping them. And then in Proverbs chapter 18 and verse 19, oh, here's a biggie to chew on. Love covers by choosing not to take offense Proverbs 18 and verse 19, the Bible says, A brother offended is harder to be won than a strong city, and their contentions are like the bars of a castle. Charity makes a choice. Charity says, first of all, I choose not to be offended. And then, by choosing not to take the offense, you don't have to worry about this one here, where it is hard to win the offended brother. Have you ever been guilty of having unintentionally offended another believer in Christ? Do you know how hard it is to win that person back? To get them back, if you will, onto your side where there is a friendship restored and a fellowship like you want to enjoy? Do you know how hard that is? It is easier to not offend than to try to rebuild something after the offense has taken place. But that's a two-way street. It is my responsibility not to offend others, but other people have a responsibility as well. Go to Psalm 119. Psalm 119, look at verse 165. Psalm 119, verse 165 says, Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. So you you see, I have the responsibility not to cause offense, not to be offensive, not to overtly uh, try to offend somebody, and the other person has the responsibility not to be so quick to take offense, not to wear their feelings, their emotions, and everything else on their shirt sleeve, and and laying their heart out to be stepped on. It's like, I just dare you, don't step on my heart, I'm going to put it out there. No, that is wrong. That is so wrong. That isn't charity. The final point tonight, we look first of all at the consequences when love is missing, then the compensation when love is present. Let's look at the capstone on love, the capstone on love, 1 Corinthians 13, the very first part of verse, uh, chapter 13, the very first part of, I got to get back to the right spot here, excuse me, there we go, the very first part of verse 8. The Bible says three words very, very simply, charity 
never faileth. Charity never faileth. The word faileth has a multitude of meanings. In the original language, it means to fall out of, to fall down from, to fall off of, to lose it, to perish, to fall from a place from which one cannot keep, to fall from a position, to fall powerless, to fall to the ground, to be without effect. Agape love, charity never faileth. Let's try to grasp this if we could. Uh, We're not going to look up the reference, but in Mark's gospel, chapter 13, verses 24 and 25, the Bible says prophetically that the stars will fall, but charity never falls. The Bible tells us in 1 Peter 1, 24, that the flower fades and falls, but charity never will. Acts 12, 7, the Bible says that the chains fell from Peter's wrists, but charity never will. Agape charity never will fails, never falls, never loses its its effect. Bible commentator and pastor Paul Apple writes this. He says, love cannot fail because it shares God's nature and God's eternity. Tonight, Christians, could anybody accuse you or I of loving too much? Is that an accusation that could be leveled against us that, oh, they are just, they just love way too much? Could that be said of us? Usually the opposite is what is said. Usually we don't love enough. Tonight as Christians, let's, in the way of invitation, as the way of a challenge tonight, let's ask the Lord, first of all, to reveal to us, where is it that love is lacking in my life? To whom is love lacking? Where is charity not responding to someone else's deficiency? Maybe put it that way. Because we can spot the deficiencies in other people's lives very easily, can't we? All right? So as you're thinking in your mind, and go ahead, I, I'm looking out and there's nobody here, so I'm not, there's nobody I'm thinking of tonight. And you're watching me, so that means you're thinking, oh, I can tell you his deficiencies. Okay, very good. You've pointed out my deficiencies. You've got them in your mind. What is charity doing about those deficiencies, my deficiencies in your life? What's it doing? You know, we can offer up all sorts of excuses for not doing what the Lord wants us to do. But Christians, we can't afford to do that. This is what God wants us to have. He wants us to have and to display His love. If you're listening tonight and you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, uh, lost soul, that love that we're talking about tonight is a love that took Jesus Christ to Calvary's cross for you. Jesus didn't do it because He didn't have anything else to do. Jesus didn't come to this earth because he was bored with heaven. Jesus came to this earth. He took on flesh and blood. He took on a body for you and for me because he loves us. And because we had a severe deficiency, it's called sin. And that sin separates us from God. It separates us from all eternity, from being able to be in heaven. And so long as we have that deficiency... So long as the the sin nature has never been dealt with by by God's grace and by God's mercy, we will die and leave this world and go into hell for an eternity. But because Jesus loves us, we can be saved. Because Jesus loves us, we can know what it is to be forgiven. Because Jesus loves us, we can trust Him as our Savior because He showed that love for us on Calvary's cross. And I wonder, lost soul tonight... uh, Are you overwhelmed by the fact that that God loves you that much that He would send His only begotten Son so that whosoever, and that's you, would believe on Him, would not perish but have everlasting life? Tonight, if you believe and you're ready to accept the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior, you believe that Jesus died for you because of you, that His blood paid the price of your sins, and that he was put into the tomb and he arose again from the grave to give new life to all who would believe. If you believe that tonight, would you be willing to call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved? If you would, just bow your heads, close your eyes, and, and make this your prayer between you and the Lord. Dear Lord, I know that I'm a sinner. And I know that I don't deserve salvation. But Lord, I believe Jesus loves me and that he died for me. And I believe tonight, Lord, that there is no other way to be saved than to believe in what Jesus did for me. 
But Lord, I not only believe that you died for me, I believe that you were buried in the tomb and that you arose from the grave and that you are alive. I am asking the living Savior to save my soul tonight. And I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Did you do that tonight? Did you mean that? The Bible makes a promise to you that says that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That is God's promise to you. And so tonight, if you did trust Jesus Christ as Savior, would you get in contact with us here at this church and let us know that you have trusted Jesus as Savior? For those of you that know the Lord as your Savior, uh, put these truths into practice throughout this week. Look forward to seeing you back on Wednesday night. Hope this is a great week for you. I hope that you use this week for the Lord's honor and glory. Let's close in prayer tonight. Father, we thank you, Lord, that we've had this privilege to be together uh, online, and we just thank you, Lord, for the time that we have had in your word. Lord, as we get ready to go into a brand new week, we commit that week to you, Lord, praying for your will to be done and praying that we would be usable vessels for you. We ask it all in the name of Jesus. Amen.